Hey, it's Dr. Nissi from EasyDOTPhysicals.com. Back with another video. This is a very important video with everything that's going on with marijuana testing and the federal government. This video is all about everything that I think that you need to know about saliva testing and why this is important is that the federal government and probably everyone else that tests specifically for marijuana is going to be moving towards saliva testing instead of a urinalysis or hair testing. So this is everything that I think that you need to know about saliva testing, but certainly there could be other things that you have questions about. That's what the comments are for. So leave a comment in the comment section of this video if it's a question and I will answer those questions. I made a bunch of notes here, so I'm going to be looking, at, looking down here uh, at my computer to go over the notes for this video because there is a lot. We are going to be talking about a lot of different subjects. So first thing to note is that even though marijuana is being moved from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, in a lot of cases, including if the federal government mandates it, you are going to be required to be drug tested. That is just the reality of the situation, and a lot of times, and with the federal government as well, it is going to include marijuana testing. But they are moving away from urinalysis, and they're moving towards saliva testing. All right, so we are going to cover today how a saliva test is actually performed, what are they actually testing for, what the cutoff levels for saliva testing are, again, specifically for marijuana, the detection times, how long can they detect marijuana after you've stopped using uh, on a saliva test, and very important, secondhand smoke, and can secondhand smoke cause you to test positive. And I will leave timestamps in this video, so if you wanna skip ahead to any of those particular topics and you're not interested in the other ones, feel free to do so. All right, so just to be 100% clear, when it comes to the federal government and testing, <coughs> currently, your analysis is still the standard. So if you have an upcoming drug test and you are concerned about testing positive for marijuana, for THC marijuana, please home test. It's the best way to know if you are going to pass that drug test. I will leave my preferred home drug test, a link to them in the description box below, and also exploroacademy.com. This is a course we put together myself in combination with the drug testing company, Exploro. You go through the course and there basically is a money back guarantee if you do not pass an upcoming drug test for marijuana. Specifically, both links will be in the description box below. All right, so on to the first topic, and it is how is a saliva test actually performed? So once the federal government allows saliva testing, that's coming up very soon, I made a video on the timeline of that, um, how is this test going to be performed? And it's not gonna change how the test is performed, how a saliva test is performed. They perf saliva tests are performed now in certain circumstances, just not by the federal government. The federal government currently does not allow it. They only allow a urinalysis. So you do not just spit into a cup. So you don't give the sample that way or similarly to how you would give a urine sample. Right now, how you give a urine sample is you physically urinate into a cup and then you hand it back to the collector. With a, a saliva test, they actually swab the inside of your cheek. So I've gotten a lot of comments on a lot of videos saying that they could be collecting your DNA and this type of thing. And I guess that would be theoretically possible. You can collect DNA from a cheek swab. I don't know if there's anything that can be done about that. If the government at the end of the day, if they want your DNA, they are going to get it one way or the other. I, I just don't know if there's any way uh, to get around that. Again, if you have to be drug tested and you have to be saliva tested, this is just the way that it is. So the only way, if you feel like they're collecting your DNA, the only way to get around that is to not have the test performed and potentially not have whatever occupation requires that test. All right, next topic. What are they actually testing for? And this is a little bit different or significantly different from how a urinalysis works. A urinalysis tests for THC metabolites and these metabolites can again be stored 
in your body fat and released over time. So uh, that is a somewhat inefficient way of detecting if someone is using marijuana. The uh, saliva test has been confirmed by the FMCSA as testing for THC exclusively, not any other analyte or metabolite. Again, this has been confirmed in the FMCSA literature and they're basically setting the standard for all federal government testing. Um, and this again keeps the detection window only to when you have active THC in your system. And this is very similar to like if you were going to be blood tested. All right, and next up, let's talk about the cutoffs because the cutoffs are different too. And again, confirmed by the FMCSA in their literature, the cutoff for saliva testing will be four nanograms per milliliter and the confirmatory test will be two nanograms per milliliter. And this is similar to how the urinalysis works. You will go through uh, one test and if you fail or test positive on that test, they do a confirmatory test. It's a different kind of test, but it has a lower threshold, a half of the threshold, and that's the same with this test as well. If you fail or test positive at four nanograms per milliliter, they will retest for confirmation, but that test is sensitive to two nanograms per milliliter. So they're gonna find if you actually um, do have THC in your system. But this is very important as well, and I get a lot of questions, there's confusion about this, is they don't automatically do the confirmatory test. So you have to test positive or fail at four nanograms per milliliter in order for the confirmatory test to be performed. And that's the same as your analysis is currently. So again, four nanograms per milliliter on a saliva test, that is going to be the cutoff that has been confirmed by the FMCSA. All right, next subject, and this one is, this is the most important, this is the reason for saliva testing as opposed to your analysis, and it's the detection time. So this one's huge. So the detection time on a saliva test is only a couple of days. So if you stop using, you may test positive for a couple days after stopping use. So this still means that you could use on the weekend and if you have a test on Monday, a random test or even a scheduled test and you decide to use uh, on the weekend on, on Monday, you could potentially still test positive. So of course, this is not uh, perfect if the goal, and this is the goal, the goal is to determine simply if someone is presently under the influence, if somebody's going to be working, operating machinery, driving, flying a plane, under the influence. So does this necessarily um, alleviate all concerns about not catching someone who's using on their off time and not under the influence during their work time? It certainly does not, but it is a huge step in the right direction. Again, I've made a number of videos on this subject, so I'm not gonna go all into a urinalysis, but on a urinalysis, you can test positive for months, even after you've stopped using, and it's because they're testing for metabolites. Metabolites, again, get stored in your body fat and can be released later in time. And even if you've stopped using, you can test over the threshold and test positive, just like you if you use if you were using yesterday, the day before, or, or presently. There's no way to make that determination. So with saliva testing, the window is cut from months, maybe a month, two months, three months, down to days, one, two, maybe up to th three days. So this is, this is really the reason for saliva testing. It's to not test people or catch people, I guess, that were using a month ago. It's to try to get closer to detecting people who are presently using. All right, and finally, and again, this is very important as well, let's talk about secondhand smoke. So what if you are not a user, but you're around people who do use, who smoke in front of you, basically? So the FMCSA, again, in their documentation, has quoted multiple studies stating that secondhand smoke would not cause a false positive. So if someone who's not using is around other people, that are using, that are smoking in front of them, 
they will not test positive on a saliva test. They did multiple studies or they cited multiple studies and they confirmed with each of these studies that those people, the people that were not using, were not testing positive with a pretty big exception. The exception was a case where a person was in a tightly confined room with multiple other people smoking in very close proximity to them and there was no ventilation. So in this case, the person did test positive. Now, here's what the FMCSA said, basically. The FMCSA justified that the person testing positive without using should test positive and it's because the participant, the person that was not using, stated that they actually felt high. So they basically got a contact buzz. So again, for the FMCSA, they felt that that person testing positive was actually a good thing because they were impaired similarly to if they were using directly. So just because they weren't using directly, they were still feeling the effect. Again, they were getting a contact buzz, so they were testing positive like if they were actually using. So the bottom line here with secondhand smoke is if you're around other people and they're using and you don't get a contact buzz, you don't feel anything, you're just around other people that are using, you almost certainly will not test positive on a saliva test in any time frame, even if they test you immediately after being around these other people. But if you get a contact buzz because you're, for some reason, in a very tight space with multiple people maybe uh, smoking around you, there's no ventilation, and again, you feel the effects of the other people using around you, then it's quite possible that even after a couple days, you may test positive. All right, so again, that is, that is everything that I can think of that you may need to know about saliva testing. Now, the laws haven't been completely finalized yet. They're still working on certifying labs so they can actually implement this process. So a lot of updates are going to be coming. Stay subscribed to this channel. Make sure the bell notification is hit because when the FMCSA gives me new information about updating the standards or dates or whatever, I make update videos. All right, questions, leave them in the comments section below. I will answer those. I'll be back with another video very shortly. Until next time, everybody, stay safe.